Hi there, friends. I hope that you're doing well, and uh, Merry Christmas to you. I hope that uh, you're enjoying the week leading up to uh, such a special day this Sunday, and uh, I'm glad that you can take time right now to tune into the Wednesday Word. And what we're going to look at today is a little bit different. We're going to step out of the passage that we've been looking at just to focus in on the Christmas story, or at least a portion of that today. Before we do, uh, let me just give a quick reminder of a couple of things. Because of Uh, how things land on the calendar this year. We're going to do things just a little bit differently this weekend. Uh, Christmas falls on a Sunday, and so we're going to move our whole Sunday morning service to Saturday evening. We're going to expand our Christmas Eve service a bit. It won't be quite as long as a normal Sunday morning. It'll be probably more like 70 or 75 minutes rather than an hour and a half, but I really hope that you can be a part of that. It'll be 4 o'clock on Saturday afternoon, and it's a great service for you to bring Uh, family members, friends, neighbors, to uh, it's just such a neat opportunity to be introduced to Jesus and to really the life and ministry of Jesus. It's going to be the Christmas story, but it's going to be more than just the Christmas story. And I think that it'll be a message that will resonate for people who maybe have gotten turned off to church or who don't know Christ. And so I hope that you can join us on uh, Saturday afternoon at 4 o'clock at Freedom. And also, just to let you know, uh, the following weekend... Sunday will be New Year's Day, and we will have our normally scheduled uh, Sunday service and children's activities. All of that stuff will happen as usual on January the 1st. So I hope you can join us for both of those times. Uh, But as I said, today we're going to do something a little bit different, stepping out of uh, 1 Timothy. I don't want to just look at a little bit of the Christmas story, sort of the beginning part of the story. And I want us to just for a few minutes consider, as we look at the story, not so much the what, but the who. We, we all know what happened at Christmas. We know what the point was that first Christmas. But I want us to really focus in on the who, the people who were involved in this. And I, I want to look at the verses leading up to what happened in Bethlehem. Uh, beginning in verse 26 of Luke 1, a lot of times we sort of lose sight of the fact that the beginning of the Christmas story is actually the story of Jesus' relative, John the Baptist, being conceived and born to Zechariah and Elizabeth, relatives of Mary. And so they've just found out that in their very old age <clears throat> that Elizabeth is pregnant and her child is going to be uh, the, the figure that Jewish people have been looking for for so many generations. He's going to be the great prophet that would be the forerunner that would then hand, sort of hand off the baton to the Messiah and his ministry. So in verse 26 it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. This is probably not a fun visit. This is probably an attempt to escape all of the ridicule and the questions and the judgment that would accompany Mary being pregnant without being married at this time. She's running to Elizabeth in hopes of finding someone who could understand. And When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? You can see that with the filling of the Holy Spirit, the thing that accompanied that in Elizabeth's life was not that she spoke in tongues. It was that she began to speak prophetically. She was given 
a word of knowledge, a, a word of, of insight as to what was going on. And she speaks prophetically about what's happening with Mary and the child that she's carrying. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And then what follows that I'm about to read is what's known as the Magnificat. It's Mary's song of praise, and it's, uh, it's all scripture. It's, it's verses taken from all over the Old Testament. As Mary, you can just tell she's operating in the, with the filling of the Holy Spirit as she begins to give praise to God and declaring the promises of scripture in a way that speaks prophetically over what Jesus' life and ministry will look like. And it says, in verse 46, And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. In other words, God knows what a nobody I am. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. And now listen as Mary begins to describe what the ministry of Jesus will do, what it will accomplish, and what it will look like. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down the rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has lifted up the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. And he has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. And Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. As I said, I want us to just consider for a moment the people involved in the story and in the ministry of Jesus. And I just want to point out a couple of, of simple things, but they're just, to me, so important that we I don't want us to ever lose this as we celebrate Christmas. And the first thing that just is so obvious in every part of the Christmas story and truly in every book of the Bible is the simple truth that God does great things through the most unexpected people, through the most ordinary people. When we look at the birth of Jesus and when we think about the importance and the magnitude of, of what God is doing through Jesus, this is the most important event that has ever taken place in all of human history the arrival of God in the flesh to save humanity. And when you think about all that's going to be involved in this, God becoming an infant, God having to be taught how to do everything, how to walk and talk right from wrong, how to live, how to relate to people, how to work, just everything in life, having to be taught by a human mother and father. And we would think, wow, God's going to have to really look far and wide to find the greatest people, the most experienced parents, the, the wisest people on earth. And yet when we look at this story, we're reminded that God uses the most ordinary and unexpected people to do the most extraordinary things. God chose a moment in time that is just almost baffling for us, where the world stood and, and just with all of the Roman oppression in the Holy Land, he chose a moment in time and he chose a group of people who were so oppressed and so impoverished. And, and he chose a couple who weren't even married and who were obviously quite young. We don't know for certain, but most people believe that they were likely teens and they're just, they're nobodies. They, they don't have any significant pedigree that we would say, oh, that's real obvious why God would pick Mary, why God would do this extraordinary thing with Elizabeth, why he would pick Joseph. They live in a remote mountain village in Galilee up in Nazareth. From the, the outside looking in, it just seems like these are the most unlikely people for God to use. And yet that's what we find that God has always done in history is he, he doesn't pick the people who deserve to be used greatly by him. He chooses whoever he wants to. In fact, the scripture makes it clear that God loves to look at those who are weak and to work powerfully through them so that the world can see and recognize, oh, that was God. That was the power of God. That was the grace of God instead of it being such a smart or a gifted uh, or, or powerful individual. And when we look at Elizabeth and we look at Joseph and Mary, it's the picture 
of weakness. It's a picture of, of being a nobody. Mary says in her song of praise, the Lord's been mindful of the humble state of his servant that I'm just a nobody, and yet God is doing something so significant through me that forevermore, every generation is going to call me blessed. Even Mary, at such a young age, recognized that God was about to do something so significant that the world would never forget her. To me, that's a great reminder for us that we may feel like God couldn't use me God, with you know, my background or the, the things that I've done, or maybe because I don't have any great qualifications. I don't have any great wisdom. I don't have a great education. I'm not positioned to have a lot of power or influence. So what could God do through me? Anything he wants to. In fact, the thing that the scriptures seem to be so clear about is it seems like the bigger the nobody you are, the greater the likelihood that God does something extraordinary through you. The angel Gabriel declared about Jesus when he spoke to Mary that Jesus would assume the throne of his father David. Well, there's probably no bigger statement that could be made about how important and powerful the reign of Jesus would be because David was the high watermark of all the rulers of Israel. The Jewish people always looked back to David as the ultimate leader. And Gabriel is declaring Jesus is going to be a leader even greater than David. But it's worth remembering even David, the greatest leader, so profoundly used of God, what a nobody he was. He didn't have any kind of royal lineage. In fact, when Samuel came to anoint the next king of Israel and he went to Jesse and, and asked to see his sons, Jesse brought in seven of his sons, thinking surely one of these is the one. David was number eight. He was the, the youngest. He wasn't even worthy of being called in from the fields tending to the sheep. He was the nobody over and over in Scripture. This is the kind of person that God uses. We think back to Moses, the great deliverer of the people of God. He's, he's a type of what Christ would end up doing for humanity. But, you know, we look at Moses, and Moses was a, a child of slaves. And yes, through the hand of God, he ended up being brought up in Pharaoh's household. And it looks like, well, okay, maybe this is somebody God could really use to deliver his people. Here's a, a slave who's being raised as royalty, so now he's going to have power and can do something. But what we discover is Moses couldn't be greatly used by God until he had been removed from that setting and on the run for 40 years for having killed someone. And in 40 years of living as as a foreigner and, and with you know no connections anymore and looking like his life is going nowhere, he finally gets humbled to the point that God can greatly use him. The point again and again, we could give countless examples that God does the most extraordinary things through the most ordinary people. Mary and Joseph and Elizabeth and Zechariah are wonderful pictures of this, that everything in the Christmas story emerges from these characters who are just the biggest nobodies. And the other thing that I want us to notice today as we look at this passage is not just who it is that God uses but who it is that this Messiah, that this Savior of the world has come to, to work on behalf of, who it is that benefits from Jesus coming into the world. And it's, once again, the most undeserving, the most unexpected people. Because even though we may, may never say it this way, our thoughts may never crystallize quite like this, I think a lot of times we imagine that the blessing of God and the favor of God belongs to those who deserve it because they've been good enough, they've been religious enough, they've tried hard enough. And the truth of the matter is that's not the message of the New Testament. Jesus didn't come for good people. Jesus didn't come for religious people. Jesus came for desperate people. The message of how God works and what Jesus' ministry would look like it's a message in, in Mary's song that we really don't talk about much in the American church because it's so uncomfortable for us. Hear the words again. He has scattered those who were proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. This is not a message that's comforting for us. This is a message that's good news for those who are desperate. Think about the ministry 
that Jesus carried out. Think about his announcement at the very beginning of his ministry in Nazareth. In Luke chapter 4, when Jesus read the Isaiah 61 scroll, that great prophetic word about what the, the ministry of the Messiah would look like, he says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to mind up the brokenhearted, to give sight to the blind, to release those in prison, to set the, the captives free, all of those people that he said that he's come for are people who are desperate. It's not people who have got it together and are living really well and who just need just a little bit of help, just a little bit of insurance, just their ticket to heaven being punched. Jesus didn't come to be a helper. He came to be a savior. You know, in my experience, it seems like of all the people that I've known in my life who identify themselves as Christian, it seems that there are really kind of three different groups of people who say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. There's the first group, and that's those people who when they say they're Christian, they really have no idea what that means. It's just sort of their uh, label, their way of saying, well, I'm not a Muslim, and I'm not a Jew, and I'm, and I'm not a Hindu, I'm not any of those other things. So yeah, I, you know, Christian sounds like the best identifier. It's, it really doesn't have any meaning. And there's a second group of people, and that is those people who have a casual relationship with Christianity. These are, are good people who typically came from a Christian family, and they know something of Christian values. They have some knowledge of the Bible and of the gospel, and who have prayed a prayer of salvation, and who probably have some level of comfort in going to church, probably go to church when it's comfortable, and definitely are trusting in, you know that, that Jesus is their Savior and trusting Him to be the one to get them to heaven, but they just have a good casual relationship with Jesus. They're, they're good people, and, and really they don't need Jesus to do anything that significant for them. They just need a little help from Jesus. As much as anything, just make sure I get to heaven, and if I could just ask one thing from Jesus, it really boils down to this. Could you just sort of keep my life the way it is? You know, I'm a good person generally living a good life, need a little help here and there, but mostly can you just sort of protect the comfort level that I've got as just a good middle-class American church-going person? That second group is people who just are sort of comfortable with Christianity. But there's a third group of people that I've known, and they don't look much like either of the first two groups. These are people who didn't need a little bit of help. These are people who desperately needed a Savior. Something was wrong. Something made them desperate. It may have been things that have happened to them. It may have been their own poor choices. It may have been poverty. It may have been sickness. It may have been you know, tragic things that have happened to them. They've been cheated on. They've been done wrong. They've been abused. Whatever it is, sin, cruelty, sickness, but they were desperate enough that they didn't need a helper. They needed a Savior. And they turned to Jesus in desperation. And they continue to cling to Jesus in desperation because they understand that apart from Jesus, their lives are lost, undone, and wrecked. These are the people who have a little bit of a wild-eyed look about them in terms of when you talk about Jesus. It's that look of Jesus isn't just the, the big guy upstairs. Jesus is their closest friend. Jesus is the one for whom they are so grateful for everything that they have. You know, when I think about those three groups, it's the third group that Jesus is, is coming for and is, that Jesus is going to bless. It's the people who are desperate. It's why that declaration in Luke 4 is so powerful because it announces it's not the, the middle-class person who's just going, Jesus, just make sure I get to heaven and make sure nobody disturbs my life very much. No, it's the person who goes, I desperately need you. I don't need a helper. I need a Savior. That's who Jesus came for. Jesus didn't come for a comfortable middle class who wanted a ticket to heaven. Jesus came for people who were broken and desperate, needing a Savior. That's why when Jesus preached the most important sermon of his entire ministry, the Sermon on the Mount, he opened with these words, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now you may think, well, does that mean I'm at a great disadvantage if I'm comfortable, if I'm wealthy, if I'm middle class, if I, if I don't live in desperation, you're not at a disadvantage. Because the reality is what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 3. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who realize that spiritually we're all beggars. We're all born into abject poverty and we are in desperate need of a Savior. What we need is to have the blinders removed so that we see all of us are desperate for a Savior. From the highest to the lowest, from the most faithful churchgoer to the person who seems furthest removed from Christianity, from the person who, who cleans up and looks good and talks a good talk to the person who has no idea about the Scriptures, Jesus came for people who were spiritually impoverished, and all of us are. And the good news is, through the declaration of, of Mary, through the declaration of Isaiah and Jesus himself, Jesus came to be a Savior who would transform life for all of us who realize how desperately needy we are. God loves to use the most surprising and unexpected people, and God loves to bless and help those who are most undeserving, people like you and me. Isn't that good news? That is the message of Christmas, and that's why we all have reason to celebrate. Would you join me as we go to the Lord together in prayer right now? Father, we give you thanks for all the good gifts that you bring into our lives, but most of all for the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have come to lift up the humble, the broken, the desperate, and the needy. And thank you that you include us in that. Thank you for how you change our lives. We need you. We long for your saving work to continue to transform us, to continue to make us into the sons and daughters of God. I pray that as we move through this season, Lord Jesus, that you would give us fresh revelations of who you are and of what it means for us to belong to your family. I pray for every person listening to this today that your hand of blessing and favor would rest on them, that your peace would rest in their hearts and on their households through this season. We welcome your work among us, and we pray for a great time as we worship and celebrate together this weekend. And we pray it, Jesus, in your matchless name. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in today. I hope to see you Saturday afternoon at 4 o'clock, and I hope that you have a very Merry Christmas. Take care.